expert field research and analysis, practical and imaginative policy prescriptions, effective high-level advocacy. These are the three approaches favored by an influential international organization, the International Crisis Group. It is a great honor to have today with us the president and CEO of the International Crisis Group, Mr. Jean-Marie Guénaud. Mr. Gaino was the head of the United Nations Department for Peacekeeping Operation from 2000 to 2008, a period that included the intense negotiation and spiraling crisis in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Sudan. And Mr. Gaino is also the author, the author of a recently published memoir entitled The Fog of Peace, a memoir of international peacekeeping in the 21st century. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Jean-Marie Guénaud. Well, let me first uh, thank the uh, Geneva Center for Security Policy for inviting me to join this 20th anniversary. I mean, this is, the GCSP is a great institution that reflects the, the best of Geneva, the best of Switzerland, and an international outlook, a sense of openness that is very important at this moment in uh, international relations. Um, it's a great honor, it's also a great challenge to speak after Peter Maurer because he has a rather unique way of weaving a conceptual framework with very operational and practical considerations. Uh, so I will just try to follow on uh, what he has uh, said and uh, reflect on uh, today's security challenges. And it's, it's a difficult topic because as you look at it, you can say it's the best of time or it's the worst of time. Indeed, when you look at uh, uh, global polls, you see that hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of uh, abject poverty and feel that this world and the basic security that they enjoy is much better than anything uh, that we have seen in the history of humanity. And when you look uh, more closely at uh, Europe, where we are, uh, you see in a Eurobarometer poll uh, that 90% of uh, Europeans feel safe in their neighborhood. They're only 80% to feel safe in their country, because the closer uh, you think, the safer you feel. Uh, but even 80% is, uh, is a pretty high figure. figure. And yet, there is uh, this sense of uh, doom and gloom where combination I mean, a lot of I mean, horrible things uh, that uh, Peter referred to uh, that are happening and a lot of various issues that are popping up from the Islamic State to the return of war in Europe to the risk of uh, nuclear proliferation to collapsed states in, uh, in Africa uh, and the humanitarian plights of uh, hundreds of uh, thousands resulting from uh, that collapse all that paints a very different picture. So where are we? Are we entering a world that is a more dangerous world or just a different world? I think the answer to that question depends a lot on the time frame you pick. If you pick a very long time frame, like a, a thousand years, as some have, uh, they would say that there is a long-term trend that points in the direction of less conflictuality. Uh, that the, the world a thousand years ago was a much more Hobbesian uh, world uh, than today's world, and that human societies have developed structures that make actually for much less conflict today. On the other hand, you could say that because moral progress doesn't follow uh, technical progress, our capacity to kill has been massively amplified, and certainly the last century uh, witness the two most murderous conflicts in the history of humanity. But if we move to a shorter 
uh, and more practical time frame and take a closer look at re recent de decades, in a way we are also confused, uh, if not more. Because on the one hand, there is a solid body of literature uh, that points uh, to a decline of conflict since the end of the Cold War. Uh, decline both in numbers of conflict and numbers of victims of conflicts. At the same time, there seems to be a definite pickup of conflicts in, uh, in uh, recent uh, years. And that is certainly what shapes our uh, perceptions. I mean, the horrendous human toll of the Syrian war, the, I mean, uh, the desperate people drowning in the Mediterranean are the most eloquent, elo eloquent illustration of that sharp deterioration. So, is it a temporary aberration or the harbinger of worse things to come? To be honest, I don't think we know. And I don't think there is any predetermined uh, course there. A lot will depend on how we react to a new set of facts. But to react wisely, we certainly need to understand the facts first. And so let me try uh, in this intervention to challenge a few ideas and maybe to offer a few thoughts. The dominant idea that you hear a lot those days is, uh, for lack of a better expression, the notion of a return to geopolitics. Uh, uh, the so-called uh, realist school likes to warn us that the postmodern world of European integration, soft power, declining nationalism is over. This was just a hangover of, the post, of a post-Cold War moment. Russia may have been temporarily knocked out by the collapse of the Soviet Union, but Russia is back, and Putin, according to those analysts, is the true heir to Catherine the Great, who wrote to Voltaire in French, uh, and that certainly would be a big difference with President Putin. I doubt that he would write in French. Uh, so Catherine, uh, Catherine the Great wrote, Je n'ai pas trouvé de meilleur moyen de protéger mes frontières que de les étendre. Uh, I have not found a better way to protect my borders than to extend them. It's very elegantly said, uh, but a little concerning. Um, well, the world of hard, power, of hard power is indeed asserting itself, and not just in Europe. Many are those who want to read Asia with European lenses. China is emerging and asserting itself in the same way German, Germany asserted itself, according to that, uh, to that uh, line of thought. Uh, Europe may have lost its strategic centrality, but it can console itself with the thought that the rest of the world has no other path to follow than a European path. At best, learning from the tragic experience of many centuries of European wars that eventually shaped and defined today's European nation states, at worst, repeating the European experience, but in an age of nuclear weapons. Uh, the competition over maritime spaces in Asia would be a confirmation of that vision. So the, the attraction of such traditional analysis is that it brings us in familiar territory where we can indeed use the tools and learn the lessons of a very long history. We can quantify Russian power, we can evaluate its nuclear, its conventional military capacities, we can assess the best way to balance uh, them, and we can reassure ourselves with hard facts, like a relatively weak demography, a an unsustainable fiscal position at the present level of energy prices. And so, in that uh, school of thought, uh, Russia should not be able to sustain its present increased level of military spending. And we can conduct the same exercise with China, uh, of the same exercise of uh, realpolitik, although with very different conclusion as uh, far as future trends uh, are concerned. And certainly I would say that such traditional balance of power calculations should not be dismissed. They, can, they have their, use, their utility especially when dealing with leaders who are not postmodern at all and who attach great importance to such metrics as number of tanks, missiles, and, war and uh, warships, and uh, leaders who sometimes show little consideration for those who have different yardsticks. And the way most European countries ignore them 
relying on the United States to provide a balance may be dangerous. But is it the full story? Geopolitics may be back, but it is a very different type of geopolitics. So let me uh, now uh, sort of challenge the received uh, wisdom after recognizing that it has uh, some merits. Today we see a world in which there are multiple layers of power and no unifying space. Yes, there is only one global power at this stage, which is the United States, with global interest and global reach, but uncertain commitments, with a reluctance to weigh in uh, in all situations. Maybe that is uh, wisdom, but it certainly uh, changes the dynamics. There's a potential global power, which is China, but with a differentiated approach, and uh, which sometimes is seen as weighing too much in its region and not enough uh, further, further, uh, further away. And then there are regional powers with no global reach, but very strong regional interest. And that makes for quite a fragmented world, not unified by an overarching threat like the Cold War was, not unified always by overarching principles, and that's a concern. A world where Europe is no more the epicenter and the way, for instance, the Ukraine crisis is seen by the rest of the world is very interesting and in some ways concerning uh, in that respect. Uh, the positive side of that is that it's a world with more flexibility. The negative aspect is that there are great regional imbalances of interest and you see them at play in Syria with very strong regional interest and weak global uh, commitments. Uh, so the conclusion of that is that the rules of the old game, so to speak, don't apply. Too many actors on a too complicated and too fragmented chessboard. Let's not regret it too much, though, because the old so-called Concert des Nations always ended in tears. It ended in catastrophic events. So. I think the celebration of geopolitics is not really warranted. Let me now go one step further. What we are seeing is a transformation of societies that indeed leads to a transformation of conflict. Conflict is always a, a reflection of society. There's a, a remarkable little book by the uh, British historian Michael Howard, I mean, The History of the European War. I think it's a, I'm not sure the exact title, but it's a short book, but very very good, that ends with the nuclear age. I mean, we should now add a, a chapter on, the, on the, the kind of conflicts that we are witnessing. Uh, what, what, are we, what are we seeing is that, uh, indeed, the accepted wisdom of the post-Cold War age was that intrastate conflict were more frequent than interstate conflict, but there is not much analysis of why was that. Uh, I would say that there is a deep crisis of the state, which has been a pillar of the Westphalian order, and the 1945 order was itself, is itself an attempt to codify uh, that order uh, so that uh, the relations between states are framed uh, within uh, interna some, uh, some international law. That crisis of the state has several features. Uh, there, are, there, are, is, there is an historical dimension to it. A crisis of legitimacy of new states, uh, the legitimacy of the anti-colonial struggle is waning, uh, the uh, legitimacy of uh, the post-Ottoman state, post state is in uh, question, the dispensation of power as arranged uh, after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire is, is under cha is challenge, and the legitimacy of post-Soviet states is in question. So we have the, the fall of two empires and the fall of the colonial empires, and we haven't yet fully dealt with that. That's the flow of the historical uh, explanations. But I would say the crisis of legitimacy of states goes further. Uh, in a flatter world, uh, states are both too distant and yet too small. Too distant for people in a very mobile world to feel a very strong sense of community, and too small to address issues that are beyond uh, the borders of states, even the biggest ones. And in a connected world, international informational connectivity and physical connectivity challenge static communities. 
Uh, and that has far-ranging implications. It triggers a crisis of politics, which leads to the development of identity politics and virtual communities. And I think the nationalism that we see uh, in many places, including in this uh, European continent, is more a sign of the crisis of the nation state than a sign of its vitality, actually. The very str strident affirmation of uh, one's national identity is a sense, in a way, reflects a certain sense of doubt and concern. And when there is not that, you have the virtual communities of religion uh, that are taking a, a, greater, a, a greater role. And the mobility of people in other, is another consequence. Mobility of poverty, as we see tragically, but also mobility of wealth, which has its own consequences when the very small elites of countries that desperately need those elites just walk away because they have a better future outside their own uh, country. So what does that mean for conflict and for violence? Let me just list quickly a few consequences. First, I think a fragility of states uh, that is uh, most in evidence, of course, in uh, states that are collapsing, like, like as we have, as we are seeing at the moment, as we speak in uh, South Sudan or as we see in uh, Libya. Uh, but this goes beyond that. There are also what I would call weakly governed spaces in un in otherwise very functional states. When you see how some urban neighborhoods, and uh, the challenge of big cities was uh, mentioned uh, earlier, uh, when you see the violence in some uh, cities uh, in Latin America, for instance, uh, the role of gangs, uh, you see that the neat distinction between strong states, uh, collapsed states, doesn't reflect a reality that is much more complex. And certainly this question of how cities will control their space is a major challenge at a time when cities represent more than half the world's population. Second uh, aspect of this evolution, the blurring of criminal and political agendas. Crime feeds politics, politics can lead uh, to crime. And that's uh, uh, a profound change when you see the role of prof proxies in, uh, in conflict who are half criminal network, half political movements, and who have their own logic that is only partly political. That changes the nature of conflict and certainly of conflict resolution. Terrorism, of course. Terrorism which is well adapted to a flatter world because it benefits both from the physical uh, connectivity as it can uh, uh, target uh, connecting infrastructures and uh, the tr transformation of uh, air travel is an illustration of that. But the informational connectivity, which means that a terrorist attack somewhere has global uh, reverberations and so has much more value from the terrorist standpoint than it would have if that world was not uh, so uh, connected. Terrorism thrives on connectivity. Cyber warfare is another illustration of that flatter uh, world. And it uh, also has major consequences. And if you put all that together, what you see is a, a blurring of the distinction between war and peace. Uh, Peter Maurer could speak much more eloquently than I can about the implications uh, uh, of that, because our, all our legal apparatus uh, is based on uh, making that uh, distinction. But that distinction is not so clear anymore. The blurring of the line between civilians and combatants were already mentioned. The blurring of the state of war, state of peace. You slide into war without even uh, knowing it, without acknowledging it. This has implications which are legal, which are political, which are operational. The legal ones, uh, they are those, I mean, regard, I mean, all those that uh, the Geneva Conventions uh, are dealing with, but they're also the fundamental balance of the United Nations Charter. Uh, what does it mean uh, to use uh, force in, uh, in self-defense? At what time is an act an act of war? So the whole structure uh, arrangement of 1945 there is under stress. Uh, it certainly has uh, political implications as the erosion between in external and internal affairs uh, um, 
gather space. It has operational implication, and certainly my experience of peacekeeping is that, is that peacekeepers are not deployed where there's a peace to keep. They are deployed in that gray area between peace and war, and that profoundly changes the nature of peacekeeping. So, to conclude, let me say that conflict resolution, conflict pre prevention in that world is profoundly different from what we have seen in the past, because it's as much about identifying and structuring centers of power as about balancing uh, power. And that means it's much harder uh, to end conflict. Uh, and second uh, element, international organizations are organization of states. And state is not dead. Uh, and millions of people are desperately looking for the reassurance of a state. But we are transitioning toward a new political order which will probably be post-Westphalian, for lack of a better word. And international organization will have to adjust to that, but we don't know exactly what shape that order will have. One last thought. The old structures of state may, in a number of situations, be sufficiently strong that they can concentrate power and follow the dynamics of old geopolitics. And that's good news and bad news. But the new forces at work have acquired a life of their own, and they are not under any control. And this is that mix that creates the greatest uh, dangers. Uh, because the combination of control for national policies, uh, of control allows national policies to assert themselves, but at the same time it's not enough to contain, to manage uh, those dynamics. You see it in a situation, uh, to be more concrete, in a situation like Ukraine, where, yes, there's a Russian national policy there. We could, uh, we could spend the conference discussing it. Uh, but there are also the dynamics of uh, people uh, in uh, eastern Ukraine who are partly uh, a projection of uh, Russian policy and partly uh, on their own, with their own dynamics. And that interaction is a fairly dangerous uh, dangerous one. And we probably have had already an illustration of that with the downing of a, of a jet uh, uh, liner. And so I would say that this is why we see more and more surprises. And this is why we're going to see more and more what one could call geopolitical black swans. Uh, that combination of a facade of structured state-centric policies and new forces at play which are uh, more difficult uh, to grasp. And, but should that lead us to pessimism? I think, again, the world can go several ways. Nothing is predetermined. In uh, earthquakes, we know that the buildings that don't collapse are those that, in which there has been some flexibility uh, put in by the uh, architects. And in a way, today, that's what we need. Uh, we need to use the new flexibility of the world to our advantage. Uh, we need more flexible international structures that will be able to integrate those new forces. Uh, so will this tomorrow's world be more dangerous or better than today's world? There is no fatality there. It depends upon us and, so, and those who study at the GSCSP. Thank you. <laughs>